Good evening, everyone. Thank you for turning in, tuning in to our fourth and final um, straight talk for the year. Tonight we have Miss Barb Clinkenbeard, and I'm just going to read um, a few things about her and her credentials. She is a native Nebraskan. She received two graduate degrees from Creighton, a master's, a master of science to become a nurse practitioner, and a master of education to be a clinical nursing specialist educating all levels of nurses. She also, <laughs> she also completed the postgraduate fellowship in psycho-oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute in New York. So big deal. She's a big deal, guys. <laughs> um, she, what we really wanted to harp on is that she has 25 years of experience caring for and treating patients with a variety of chronic illnesses. Um, and tonight she's going to talk to you guys about um, the fear of recurrence and what to, um, like how to continue your life after um, your diagnosis and just to help or let you guys know that there is um, a path to go on and she's the pro at this so I'm going to put it on over to her Thank and you. if you guys have any questions go ahead and um, write it in your question, question tab and we will be going on to the show about it. Hi, I'm Barbara Clinkenbeard. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is the topics that they gave me. Well, it started out about survivorship, and I think survivorship and fear of recurrence are very um, compatible in, ter in terms of talking about. Um, as they mentioned, I am a psycho-oncology um, provider at Think Whole Person Healthcare. I, I take care of chronically medically ill patients. Um, at Think, and that does include uh, psycho-oncology. What psycho-oncology is, is it's a pretty rare specialty. It's getting a little bit more popular, but in Omaha, um, there is myself as a psycho-oncology provider, and there's a therapist here that specializes in that, and um, there's a psychiatrist that also does some of that work, but it is not, considering um, the gravity of oncology and how your mind and you know your whole soul goes you know is is affected by oncology a uh, cancer diagnosis I I think it's just so important it reminds me of the fact that there's such a paucity of health care and mental health and then if you think about oncology it's like you know how can you put your mind, your body through everything in terms of chemo, radiation, the after effects, surgeries, and uh, think that your mind and your soul is not affected. So that's why um, I got interested in this, and I started over 25 years ago, and it was basically at the med center, and I was working as a psychiatric um, provider, and the oncologist, the female oncologist there said, we would like to have your presence in our clinic. So I started seeing patients, and then after I was there for a couple of years, I found out that there was such a thing as a specialty known as psycho-oncology. So... I took off from there. My grandmother always said, if you're going to do nursing, you should specialize. So um, a lot of people will say to me, how can you do this work? How can you do this day after day? And I was about four or five years into it. And my, you know, my colleagues would say, you know, the burnout rate is pretty high, four to five years. And what I would say to you is it's one of the most satisfying and gratifying um, work I've done. And I think why that is, is what I experience when I take care of and provide care for a psychiatric oncology patient, let me rephrase that, an oncology patient who has distress and difficulty dealing with it, whether it's depression, anxiety, what I experience from them is that they sort of come back to the essence of when they were young and born and from my perspective who God intended us to be and I think you just get slammed right back into that place with um, a diagnosis that can be life-threatening. Um, the topic of recurrence is one of the things we're going to focus on tonight and um, for me I think when I approach this topic with patients I ask them to name their fear and I've since I knew I was doing this talk several months in advance, I've talked to a lot of patients that come into my practice, and I've said to them, 
you know, tell me what your fear is. And I'm surprised that it's not fear of death always. It is a lot of different fears that, in, I mean, it's a great question to ask, right? So it's motivated me to ask that. And I have been told that I am fear of, I have fear of leaving my children. Um, I have fear of what this is going to do, like the financial aspect and how is this going to leave my family? Um, and there's all kinds of fears that you wouldn't expect that people would have that are not really related to death. And I've often said that death is not the worst thing that happens to people. It's the process that you go through to get there. And I think that I say that because I've taken care of patients all of my life. Um, I was a candy stripper, so <laughs> I really have done this forever. I can't imagine doing anything else. Um, so naming the fear, I think, is really helpful um, to do, and I do that in my um, sessions with patients and find out what are you afraid of, because if we name it, then we can figure out how to handle it. Um, and then one of the things that I was asked to talk about first when we went from fear of recurrence to survivorship is that I was asked to talk about, you know, what, what, how, what about survivor? What about survivors? And I think being a survivor also means different things to different people. And I asked patients that when I was first asked to give this because I thought it was going to be on survivorship. And one of my patients and someone I've seen probably the longest in my practice said, I felt like a survivor when I got through chemo. I felt like a survivor, you know, when I made it through one course, the Red Devil. And um, so it means different things to different people. And that's really important because I know that all of you, or a good percentage of you have people that you talk to that also have breast cancer. And if you don't, you know, it's probably by your choice. But I will say that talking to someone else who has it is different than talking to someone who, you know, maybe you're not feeling comfortable with, you know, saying what your fear is because it's not the same as everybody else's. So that's where I think psycho-oncology is really helpful. And the other thing I wanted to talk about is, um, what about your family's fear? Um, how do you address that with your family? Or can you address it with your family? Or is it like off, is it like the white elephant in the room? It's just off the topic. It's like, she's here, he's here. We don't have to worry about that. Um, and who does your family talk to about that? And do they need to? So I'm gonna stop for a minute and invite you to send questions to me based on, um, just the topics that I brought up and I'll be happy to talk more about that. If we don't get any questions, then I'll just keep going. Any questions? Not yet. Not yet, no. okay, come on. I agree. Yeah. Um, it can be a daunting topic that I'm talking about, but I do want you to feel like, you know, this is an hour that you can utilize and um, I'll be happy to share my experience and the hope that I have for you. Um, I saw somebody today and she's, she's there. And one of the things we talked about was, um, you know, that sense of, okay, what have I been through and what have I put my body through? And then like, who am I when I come out of this? And what I said to her, and I say this to a lot of patients is you're not only it has taken things away and you have experienced losses, but you're more than who you were before you started this. You're much more than that because you can't go through all this without being more, being more, uh, you have more courage, you have more strength, you um, have done something that you thought you probably could never do and um, that many people haven't done. And I think that's a key issue too, is that how do you relate to other people when they haven't been through it? And oftentimes it's the people we're closest to that that doesn't happen with. So how are you doing? Okay. Hi, I'm good. Come on in, Cynthia. Come on in Jump and on ask in. some questions. And I, I don't... Which side do you want? Um, I'll just come up here. Okay. So we hear that a lot, and you guys are being really, really shy, so I'm just going to chime in on some of the things that we talked about, whether it be in our retreat group or um, just online in general in our community. And one of the things that we hear a lot of is, um, you know, I my family doesn't get me, um, and they're tired of hearing the stories, but I'm not quite there yet, mm -hmm. you know, that it's... Um, 
I'm dealing with the fear and I don't know how to name it. You talked about naming it, but a lot of times I think we come together as survivors because we go through the process, we go through treatment, and it's like, okay, now what? Because everybody else, the world kept revolving. Right. right? And how do I best deal with the fears that are left behind? And I thought it was interesting that you said naming that fear, mm -hmm. because I agree with you in the sense that um, fear of death is not near as high as the fear of what's my quality of life going to be like in my right. circumstance. How are you going to die? Right? Exactly. Yes. How am I going to die? What is it going to be like before I get to that point? Because that's probably going to be a mm -hmm. very short, easier time. But, um, but I think that's one of the reasons we come together in groups so much in our own community. And that you mentioned it's hard for people to understand unless they walk in our shoes. Right. So how do we best deal with our fears and dealing with our families or friends that don't get us? And do we just find support with one another or how do we best deal with that? Um, I would say that oh it sort of depends on your family structure, the family dynamics. Um, but I also want to encourage you that you can also be the change maker in mm. that by if you look at your family and you say, well, we just don't talk about that stuff or that's not something we aren't kind of made that way. Um, I would challenge you to try and think about how you could start to talk about it and get your needs met. Uh, I've had patients that their family has walked all the distance with them and they've talked openly about their illness and about if they're terminal. And I've had other families where they never spoke about it. And then the survivors, when they come in, the survivor, they're the partner, then they come in. That's one of their biggest regrets is that they didn't, I didn't talk to them. So I invite you to try and find a way. And um, I know it's difficult with children, but I'll tell you, one of the things is they're not as dumb as you think they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they watch a lot of things around the house and they may not feel like they can talk about it but they pick up on all sorts of nuances. And I know for me right now, my nephew and niece, their grandfather's not doing well. And I just, that's one of the things I've been encouraging is like, you know, be sure to talk to them about what's going on. Cause they're already wondering. Mm -hmm. And is it more on the lines of when we say we talk with them and get them to open up, is it more in the, like for tools? We always look for tools to help do that. Is it more about, um, asking questions sometimes versus just feeling like that you're just talking you know, and saying how best do we approach that? I think, um, you know, setting up a time and say, you know, I, I want to just have family. I want to have like family time and maybe we should do this pretty regularly because I've been through a lot. And the other thing is, is that I was telling the gals earlier that my mom had pancreatic cancer and my practice just did a 180 on to, in terms of the thing I think that I was most um, aware of after going through that was the fact that the caregivers need a lot of help, need a lot of support, mm -hmm. and they don't really get much support. You know, they may say, how's, they'll say, how's your wife doing? How am I doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and they do ask that. But, and then if you think about it, when you're in the hospital or you're in chemo and radiation, it's like, they're getting a lot of the care. Mm -hmm. And it just, so um, I think, you know, it's not, one of my favorite signs, I've, and I've used this in a lecture before, is a little boy that gets off of the school bus and he holds up the sign and it says, my family has cancer. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't think you have to worry about walking around the topic. They may want to put it away, but I think it's important for you as the person with a diagnosis or with you know being a survivor of this and living through the aftermath of it is that you keep talking to them about how, how it is for you mm -hmm. and I think it's far as Cynthia one of the things you said was how do you do it I think using I statements I I I feel and you can say I feel like I'm the only one going through this or you can say I feel like this is that I've burdened all of you I feel like um, my, our life has changed completely, and um, I want to I want to talk about that. I don't want to have to deal with this on my own. Mm -hmm. I think that's hard for women to ask. I mean, we think men don't want to ask. Oh, all, but as women, we're usually the glue right. that keeps the family together, so to speak. And it's a little hard sometimes to raise the hand and say, "I need more help than just with the dishes." 
right? Mm -hmm. So um, so going back to that, the, talking about fear and fear of recurrence, because when you're diagnosed, you go through the hard part, right? Like you're, well, they say it's the hard part, but you deal with the fear of dying right away. At right. least it was the first thing that came Oh, yeah, it's a, it goes right across there. Boom. Right, I'm going to die. And so you get through treatment and you kind of shelf that because you feel like you're doing something right. to keep from dying. I'm doing treatment, I'm doing surgery, I'm getting the care that I need so that I'm going to live. But it's amazing, and like I said, we just did a poll, and it was amazing to me how off the charts it was that this fear is so rampant yes. within our survivor community. And we are really big on trying to walk away with tools that say, okay, how do we best deal with that fear? And I, I, I'll just share a personal experience. It's like one of the things I do is I have a mantra. So when my fear, when my head starts going there, I'm like, I have this mantra. Okay, not helpful. Yeah. Not helpful. Not helpful. And I just keep saying it. Right. And people that know that go through a retreat know this, but I'm like, that is just not helpful. And I don't care if I repeat it a thousand times mm -hmm. for 20 minutes, but eventually my mind will redirect mm -hmm. eventually. But are there other tools that we can use in order to, what are some other recommendations that um, you may have? Well, I think that one of the things that I wanted to talk about in terms of fear and mm -hmm fear of recurrence or fear of these things is that there's abnormal fear and there's normal fear. Okay. And um, I would say that going through the oncology cancer diagnosis mm -hmm. is an abnormal situation. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when I see people, I say, you're, this is an abnormal situation. This doesn't happen to everybody, but you're having a normal reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And then to take it, you know, sort of like, how do you deal with it? when it consumes you and you have nowhere to go and you feel like every step of the day you know getting in the shower getting dressed seeing things feeling like it's just you know that you're just slipping down emotionally because of the diagnosis what i um, often say is that's probably time when you need to seek help yes and um, talking to someone who is an expert it can be very helpful because they've had years of experience of dealing with people and perhaps they haven't had the diagnosis, but they've been willing to sit across from them, you know, and, and keep talking about it. So I would say if it's all consuming, you really, it would be really helpful to have professional, professional help. Yes. Because there could be talk therapy. It could be supportive. But one of the other things is, is there's medications. Mm -hmm. And when you have ruminating thoughts and, um, you know, fear and fear is equivalent to anxiety, but anxiety and depression are first and second cousins. So if you have a lot of anxiety, it's very likely that you end up with a depression secondary to it if you don't get it, you know, under control. Mm -hmm. And how do we know, and I'm curious, how do we know, let's say I'm that, that survivor that's struggling and it, how do I know when it's an abnormal fear or a normal fear, like you said, Consuming. Yeah, consuming. How do I, what's the litmus test for that? Mm -hmm. So that I understand it's probably time for me to get help. How do we get on best? I would say um, if, with the anxiety, it's if you have constant rumination, everything you look at reminds you of or, you know, makes you fearful of. You go to your kids' school programs, you go to some sort of sentinel annual event, and you, you know, you have this feeling of, I'm never going to see this again. Mm -hmm. And um, some of that's normal, depending on where you're at with your illness. But, you know, ruminating and sticking on it is, is robbing you of your joy. Yeah, yeah. it's like mm -hmm. you have to um, be able to put it into perspective. And I think that the tool that you have, mm -hmm. that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that there um, was a difficult situation in my own family. And one of the things I did was I thought, you know, it's not, they, these these people are on a shelf and they're on a shelf in my office mm -hmm. and they're fine because I haven't heard that they're not. Yeah. And I can't change anything about the situation, but I can know with all my heart that they're, they're in my house, they're on a shelf and, you know, so that's just a coping mechanism, mm -hmm. but it has been tremendously helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things is just try not to let it steal your joy. And if, if you have trouble with that, then, you know, come and talk to a professional. Um, 
I believe that a lot of the things that people are doing are really helpful and they come to me and talk about it. Um, staying active instead of, you know, crawling in under the covers. I think there's a time to crawl in under the covers. Mm -hmm. And I will tell patients, you know, you kind of have a, a carte blanche right now in the bed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you With know, the ice cream. Yes, yeah, so do what you have down. to do to get through it, right. And then also, I think one of the ways people feel empowered when fear is there is they um, take over their own health, figure out what they're eating, why they're eating it, what's good for you, what isn't. And even if it doesn't make a difference in the long run, at least you feel like you're driving the bus. That's right. Yeah, you feel like you're doing all you can. And, um, you know, taking in more alcohol or taking in, you know, anything that isn't balanced, I think further, you know, puts you into a tailspin of fear. Mm -hmm. um, I think finding out what is helpful. What have you used before to help you? And have they been good coping mechanisms? If they haven't been good coping mechanisms, let's find some that are helpful. I think faith is a really strong thing for a lot of people. But what do you do if you don't have that faith? What do you do if you feel as if, um, you know, there's no hope and I had faith in God or I had faith in a higher power, but did they abandon me and all this? And going back to church or, you know, being part of a community where they don't understand, it can be very difficult. So I think working through that and finding, you know, something that you hold dear to you. And if you, if it was faith, it's like trying to find a way to get back in that and the right people that can help you. Again, we talked about medication management and talking to an expert about this. Yoga can be very helpful to a lot of people. And it's pretty trendy right now. So if you can kind of get past the fact that it's trendy and I don't really want to do it because everybody else is doing it, just give it a try and see if it helps. Um, massage can be very helpful. We, um, we had a clinic, um, my partner and I had a clinic in Milwaukee and it was a psycho-oncology clinic and we had a massage therapist that had also been trained at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, and um, she learned how to do massage on oncology okay. patients. I think a pet is a wonderful thing. You know, it's like, you don't really have to talk to them. <laughs> you don't have to explain, right? <laughs> I have a little sign in my kitchen that said, um, why I find my dog so comforting is he doesn't try to find out what's wrong with me. Yeah. And you know, that's the thing with family too, is they may ask you what's wrong with you, but you, if you tell them the answer, they don't want that answer. They want to know it's something they can fix. Mm -hmm. So it kind of keeps you sometimes from talking about it. But I think a pet is a great idea. I recommend that to a lot of patients. And I just had a guy come in the other day, and I, I'm going to see him in February. And I said, tell me what your dog's name is when you come back. <laughs> he's, like, he's not sold on it yet. But, um, I, have, I have had a, a few patients, probably at least 10 in my career, that have told me that their pet was their best friend when they were going through chemo. When they're on the bathroom floor, and the floor is cold, and they have their head in the toilet, the dog or the cat is who keeps them company in the middle of the night. And uh, oftentimes that contributes to their pain if they lose that pet afterwards because it's the one that got them through that. And I don't know if you can relate to that, but I think, you know, at least understanding how important they can be. Um, do we have any questions? Any questions yet? It's a really oh, quiet. They're being really quiet. They're being really quiet. Let's see. Um, sure I just want to make sure. I think there was oh, one. Oh, there is. Why is not working out? Sorry. Yeah, there's oh, good. There's, there's, a, there's a lot. Okay. So, okay. Here we go. Okay. Great to see you again. Oh, nice. Great um, to see you. Okay. Oh, how do you address the white elephant in the room with your family? Right. Well, what I was saying is I think that goes to Anonymous. Hello, Anonymous. <laughs> That's a start. It's not exactly. be so Anonymous. <laughs> we like Anonymous. Yeah, like. exactly. It can be helpful. Um, I think the best way to do that is kind of like what I talked about earlier, is to try and find a way and a time that you're going to address what it is that you're feeling and experiencing. And you know, Cynthia said, how do you do that? And I said, I think I statements are very helpful. I am feeling, I am concerned. And, um, you know, you kind of have to set the format and also set up a time. 
and you can do this individually with your family or um, as a group. And I think one of the most powerful things you can do is to rec is to acknowledge that they went through this too. Because I tell you, when my mom was sick, it was like, I was about as far down as I can get. It was awful. And, you know, it wasn't like, she didn't do this to me. It's like the compassion and the love that you have for this person is not their fault. It's, you know, it's the gift. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we have more questions. You can come yeah. back if you don't think I answered it adequately. Mm -hmm. When do you start counting that you are a survivor any day you want to? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. There used to be this. Uh, um, there used to be this thing about a five-year mark, and then there's this thing with tamoxifen, feeling like when you're off tamoxifen. Well, now they sometimes leave people on it for ten years. So I think that line keeps moving, which is you know for people that are real concrete and have lines and need to know, I think that's an important question. I do think that when you're done with treatment or if you're going through treatment, you are surviving it. You are surviving today. And we don't have any promises. If you get yourself into the place of, well, I'm a survivor and I have survived this and I've gone through five years, it's fine if you believe it, but there's what we're talking about is the fear. Yeah, I think that was, we can ask that question a lot in our retreat, and it's interesting. I always say, you know what, from the minute you hear the words, I start, I mean, I'm yes. surviving because it, I've got a mountain to climb, but by God, every day I wake up, I'm going to survive that day. Mm -hmm. And so it's a mindset, at least for me, um, but I think you're right, there are different definitions, and it's whatever works. Why do we have to label it? So That's <laughs> right. Um, and I was going to say, too, that um, in terms of, like, being a survivor versus thinking you're not as long as you're alive and you're and then one thing I wanted to tell too is that some people put undue pressure on you and that can happen in a group setting where you want to be like what I said today with one of my patients is you want to be the homecoming queen it's like well the homecoming queen hits the wall as soon as they graduate <laughs> they can't figure out what to do with their life because they were so into word in high school so you know it's, it could be a race, it could be a marathon, but honest to God, if you don't take your heart and soul with you, you're going to hit the wall. And that I see so many patients that did not get referred to me during their treatment, and then they come in afterwards, and it's like, gosh, I wish, you know, we could have worked together as you were going through this, because that's where your heart and your soul, I mean, your mind is made up of your brain, your heart and soul, and your gut, and all of those things hurt when you're going through this. Here's one. I had so, Michelle, I had so many complications with surgery and treatment, and I'm so fearful of getting cancer again. Yes, it's, I think that's the whole part of going through this, and I, I have patients talk about that. Um, and I believe that one day I woke up and in the middle of my practice, it's been several years, but I realized that PTSD was a real thing mm -hmm. for oncology patients. And, you know, the definition of PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. And it was, you know, typically it was used for post-war veterans. And now there's a lot of people because of abuse and because of neglect that have experienced PTSD in my practice. But I have no trouble diagnosing somebody with PTSD after their cancer diagnosis when the journey has been so very difficult and not um, smooth and this is what what I always say is when you get that diagnosis it's like you just start turning your will and your life over to somebody else because the minute that you get diagnosed they're going to tell you what you're going to do the next day and that does not stop for at least a year and I often tell people you know this is your job so um the complications of surgery and treatment are really part of the trauma that you went through. Um, maybe it's hard because your story doesn't, it isn't like other people's story. You don't relate to what they had because yours was more difficult. And I'm fearful of getting cancer back again, I, I think that's pretty common with everybody. And if your journey was so difficult, of course you don't want to do that again. I don't think anybody does. And maybe yours is heightened by the complication. So perhaps it's something you need to talk to somebody about and put it into a place where you can 
live with it and cope with it. It's hard. And then another one, Kelly, after going through a diagnosis and many fears of being diagnosed, do you have suggestions on how to move forward to control the fears experienced with every ache or pain and every type yes. of biopsy? Because it does kind of every time you go through that, it's just like, oh my God. I got to go through it every three months because they saw something. Or you mm -hmm. just cringe every time there's something new. Oh, and yeah. And we get that a lot. Yes. So, is there, are there some tools to help? Well, I think paying attention to your own body is important, but I think also paying attention to the fact that some people will describe it as neurotic. Now I feel neurotic about these things. Yeah. And, um, you know, the every three months is, is, you know, sometimes that's an insurance policy. I know. I think what gets really hard is when people get out to a year and they don't get looked and they're like, who's watching me? Who's looking over me? It's tough. That's a lot of times when I get people in um, the cancer counseling center and the psycho oncology clinic because they have so much fear of recurrence and any, like you said, body ache and pain. Again, I think you're having a normal reaction to what was an abnormal situation. And maybe that helps you just to know that this is not abnormal to feel this way. And I sometimes will you know, because I have a medical background, I can say to people, I think that's probably something you should get checked out and give somebody giving you permission to get it checked out. But then if you go in there every time something hurts, then I'll hear from the oncologist. And they'll say, you know, is this it, is, this is really, you know, out of proportion. And then that's where I think you need to get help, you know, for the anxiety and fear and to talk with someone. And if it's, so going back to that abnormal and normal fear, mm -hmm. so let's say, um, just trying to get perspective, let's say that you had a biopsy and you're a little nervous before the biopsy, right? Right. And you're in that wait state of getting the results. That's a normal anxiety. Yes, it right? is. It's, it's called anticipatory anxiety. So that, we is it a matter of being more kind to ourselves and more patient and yes. to say, this is normal and I'm going to be uncomfortable for a little bit, but I'm going to be kind to myself, right? And so is there something, like, because that's legit. Everybody, Correct. I mean, it's like, oh, okay, so I, I, I'd rather go to my oncologist than the dentist. I think right. I get really worked up more to the dentist, and I know it's not comparable, but... It's true anxiety, and I let myself feel it, but it's, that's the normal attitude. It's normal, right? and that's where you, I think you need to figure out how to, what nurtures me and what doesn't. And finding somebody that can be with you that is calming rather than somebody that calls you up and says, I want to go through this with you, you have to ask yourself, is this person what I need right now? Okay. So really being aware of what it is that brings you comfort and what it is that doesn't. Um, there's just so much all over here. Um, yes, I'm from yeah. South Sioux City, and there's a barge. Martin, what was her name? Let's see here. B, I think. Let's see. Hi, Barb. Okay. Yep. So we Okay. So what about Belinda Barge? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> what about depression related to the journey? Yeah. Okay, I can answer that okay. one because that's the first thing I look for when people come in is the anxiety and depression. And even probably more important is sleep. Um, because all of these is, are going to affect your fear of recurrence if these things are not in check. Um, so depression, um, the signs are sleep, either too much sleep or not enough sleep. You can write these down if you want. Decreased interest in things that you used to otherwise find pleasure in. Struggling with guilt that you can't just shake. Energy, either too much energy or not enough energy. Struggling with guilt. Did I say guilt? You just go on. Okay. <laughs> um, energy, guilt, concentration, your ability to concentrate and focus, and then a change in appetite, either excessive or decreased. And then psychomotor agitation or just sluggish and don't want to do anything. Psychomotor is just like, you know, this tapping or just constant, you know, activity and mode of movement. Um, and then the last one is um, hopelessness. I don't ask people if they're suicidal very often. I usually just say, do you feel hopeless? And then I ask, what is the hopelessness? Like, what does it feel like to be hopeless? What is that for you? 
and then we, you know, if, it, if it's pretty down, pretty grave, I will eventually talk to them about suicide and put some things in place for them. But hopelessness is a really hard thing. And at a lot of times, you know, it can be part of who you are as a person. So like there's people who have chronic mental illness that ended up getting cancer. And there's people that have never had depression or anxiety a day of their life and got cancer. So the thing of it is, is that we deal with it the same way. And um, you need support, you need the right kind of support, you need to nurture yourself, love yourself, and um, you get help if you need it. Okay. I have two friends that recently had recurrence, one after eight years and one after 15 years. Neither were caught early. This scares me that cancer will come back as metastatic. Yeah, and I think that when that stuff happens outside of you and to somebody that's close, um, it's just a, it's just so hard to remove yourself from. And I, I think that, you know, when I've had patients that have come in and say, you know, I met somebody in pink or I met them somebody in the group and they say, uh, <clears throat> it's just getting really hard for me to have the same role in their life because I have so much of my own fear. It's good for you to not be, con it's good for you to not um, over connect thinking that you're going to be able to fix it because it's probably going to make your anxiety and fear worse, but to not completely detach, but to find a balance in there. And um, it's normal that you would be scared because you're seeing something happening outside yourself that is one of your biggest fears. Are you able to sleep at night? You know, has it interfered with your daily activity? Are you tense and nervous and anxious all the time? It's a, you know, if those things are true, you might want to get some help. Talk to somebody and get some cold. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to drink, take a drink of water. You want to jump in here? Um, the next question has something to do with that as well. Um, but a little bit different. It says, as a survivor, when I hear of a friend who is re-diagnosed, it triggers a fear I am going to be re-diagnosed. How do I overcome fear and yet be supported? Right. So I think what we talk, what I talked about a little bit ago is um, be careful about how much contact you have because it's like you want to be all things to all people and especially if somebody's going through something that you can relate to. But hopefully you're not the only person in that person's life and that you can go back to your normal existence and put it into perspective. And what I have found is that when people have stage one cancer or stage three B, their fear is pretty similar. The staging is not so much as the word cancer. And um, sometimes the people that have stage one think, I shouldn't be this afraid or I shouldn't because I'm lucky I have this. And it's like, well, cancer's cancer. And um, so I think, you know, one of the things tonight that I wanted, I'm, I'm hoping you're feeling this. I wanted to, I want to validate your feelings. I want to validate your fears and validate your concerns that you are definitely having a normal reaction to what is not a everyday normal experience. And um, the years that I've done this have just taught me that a, it's really difficult what you've been through. And, um, well, I sometimes say to patients when they first come to me is that your job this year is, you know, because I'm like figuring out how, how am I going to manage work and can I go to work? And I say, your job this year, the first priority is to, you know, save your own life, take care of yourself. <clears throat> what how is, are you doing? Oh, yes. Yeah. So this question says, what is the best way to answer the question, how are you doing? That we get from everyone. Right. We talked a little bit about that in one of my sessions today. And um, what we talked about, which is what I spend a lot of time talking to patients about, is when someone asks me how I'm doing, if I tell them how I'm really doing, it's probably not going to go that conversation may just. So you have to be careful who your audience is and realizing for yourself that your journey through cancer did not end when the treatment ended that you know, the life as you knew it is so different 
And again, you know, you're more than you ever thought you could be because you've been through this. And there's a disconnect between the people that used to be there and the people that were your friends and sometimes family members because of how they coped with it. It's like you can lose people along the way. When I've done lectures before and people have said to me, put the question out there, what's the hardest thing you've ever been through when you, uh, when patients, what is the hardest thing patients express that they go through in a cancer diagnosis? And I say losing their hair and the people that they lose along the way is always very surprising to them. And you know, sometimes you think, well, what's the big deal about the hair? And it's like, well, have you ever woke up in the morning and thought, you know, I didn't have time to do my hair or my hair needs washing or it's a little, it's like, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, but people don't have a good day when they don't have good <laughs> hair. They don't feel like they're, you know, themselves. So um, how are you doing is just such a global question. Again, I think, Sheila, you have to figure out who's asking you. Do they really want to know? Um, the One of the things we talked about earlier, too, was just like I talked to my patient about earlier was um, how are you doing? And then it's like you're over cancer. You, your cancer's done. You're cancer free. Um, you must feel great. It's great to see you. You look great. And it's like inside, it's like it's tearing you up for what other reason, whatever reason, or off and on, you're just having a really hard time. And it can feel really emotionally abandoning for people to just project all that onto you because they need to know that you're okay or they don't want to be uncomfortable. And um, this is really hard. Okay, this is a long one. How are we honest with our spouse and that we are still in physical and emotional pain without sounding like we are dwelling on things or just complaining? On that note, I think I bring it on myself. I'm not generally a complainer, but seven months out from treatment, I'm still feeling it. Yes, you are. And, <clears throat> you know, one of the things you can tell them is that when you went through chemo and radiation, you know, the chemo they gave you doesn't know that it's supposed to go to your breast. It doesn't know, you know, it goes to your ear it goes to your foot that's why you get neuropathy it does it's, it can be targeted chemotherapy but it affects your whole body and if you think about a child when they're you know young and then they're a toddler it's like they fall down you know until they're all their cells and you know, everything is developed it's like it's a they're tired all the time they sleep so basically you know, the chemo and the radiation really tears down your body and recovering from that takes a, takes a good year, if not more. And I think explaining that to them that what I've gone through has a lot, you know, it really took me, it took a lot of things away. And they know that because there's changes in, you know, how you feel and intimacy changes and your body changes and you don't feel attractive in certain ways. And, um, I don't know. I think just, again, finding the time and the space to say, I really need to talk about this. This is really important to me. And if you can't, you know, it's so easy for me to say that, but then there's so many different types of partners out there. And if you can't, you can ask them, would you mind talking to somebody with me? Because, you know, for myself, being that third party is oftentimes really helpful. You know, you can talk to me and tell me what's going on and then I can ask them. And that's been an, that's been quite a journey for me, too, where I've um, had uh, the spouse come in and then they talk about how hard it was and how I thought you were going to die. And they're like, well, you didn't act like it. You were doing the laundry. You were taking care of the kids. You were doing the dishes. You were going to work every day. Mowing, you know, you didn't act like it, it was a blip. And he's like, I was trying to keep everything together for you and, and then they are you know it's hard so just knowing that you're not the only one that went through this I think and so maybe that's an opener for you as far as how to talk to your spouse about that okay this is a good one as well um this is me stage one Julia Julie okay um, I keep getting disconnected from the q and I've attempted to submit the same question four times. That was at 725. Okay. Um, I'll have her try to work on that. Yes. I just wanted to acknowledge that we heard you. Yes. Really, we'll be with you. Um, but this question is, this is me, stage one, no chemo. Do I feel like I have the same rights to worry as the villains worse off and let through so much more than me? 
Okay. I don't know if you were talking, if you were tuned in, maybe that's why you're asking it. Um, stage one, when you, like I said, when you're diagnosed with cancer, you, you see your life flash before you. And Cynthia talked about that. Um, I think you have to validate your own experience. You have to let yourself know that um, your fears are founded. It, I mean, you, you don't really have an easy time recovering from the first time that you heard that, that you had cancer. And um, I think in time, you'll be able to put it into perspective. And your experience is different because of where they're at, but I don't think you, I don't think any of us do any good by comparing and despairing. Um, it just doesn't help. So I think, you know, validate your own experience and be with people that can help you with that. Oh, Can you read the question because we're saying I can't hear. Oh, first. I'm sorry. Um, no, go ahead. Okay. Can you, you can't read the question. Okay. I just lost my partner this summer and took a grief share class. So much of what you're talking about is similar to what I'm going through emotionally. People are so afraid to ask me how I'm doing because of how I might react. I'm thankful for the class so I can talk about my pain. That's pretty neat. Thank you for um, writing that. And I'm glad that so much I'm talking about is what you guys discuss. It tells me we're on the right track tonight. Okay. No open questions, it says? Okay. No, we, got, we answered all of those. Okay. We, we entered the chat rooms. Um, what if I can't shake the fear of recurrence? We talked about that earlier, just doing the things that are good for you and the things that um, are nurturing to you. And if you can't shake it, then I would say getting, re what's going to happen if you get professional help? Maybe that's one of the things we can talk about. I am always surprised when people are nervous coming into my office, but why should I be? People avoid this like the plague. <laughs> Today I was on the elevator and she said, what a pa uh, patient, not a oncology or psychiatric patient said to me, what do you do? And I said, psychiatry. And she goes, oh, I avoid that. I, I avoid that. I never need that. And then um, she said, maybe not everybody does, but what I thought about is just, a lot of times I feel like my patients because of the stigma that is associated with getting psychiatric help or emotional help or having emotional distress. It's like, it, I wish that stigma would just die down, but it's still out there at times. I mean, even like on the elevator today. And then I feel like my patients, I feel like I'm being judged for what I do. It's, it's not an easy thing to do. Or I'll be at a party and people will say, uh, what do you do? And then I'm like, oh, I do this. And then they're like, oh, my wife, give you my wife your card. And it's like, it's not funny, guys. It's not easy to go through what you're going through and to not have emotional support. Like I said, your mind and heart and soul goes all through this as well. Let's see, we have any other questions? Okay, let me make sure we didn't miss any. How do I deal with anticipatory? Okay, before I, uh, oncology related appointments. You know, I have um, had that question come up a lot. Or I'll, the other thing is, is before scans. Wow, when my mom had scans, my sister and I were just, oh, I never, re that's the other thing I learned after all these years of psycho oncology. I didn't realize how hard those scans are. Um, how you deal with it is just, you know, oftentimes taking somebody with you. Um, symptom, can you help me w yes. back where we were at? I'm so sorry. That's all right. You heard okay. it right down here. How do I deal with the anticipatory anxiety? Okay, related to oncology appointments. I think just making, empowering yourself. So get a list of questions. Don't just go in there and let the oncologist take over. Um, getting a list of questions and that way you feel like you're in the driver's seat. Talk about your fears, talk about what your concerns are, talk about, you know, what if, or what have you seen? Um, you know, I went to the doctor a couple weeks ago and I'm like, well, um, 
you don't want to do this scan, but if I was your wife, what would you tell her? What would you do? <laughs> so, you know, really you have to take control over your health and ask the questions that you want answers to. And I think that helps. I think that really helps with the anticipatory anxieties, like make a list of questions and feel like you're going in there and you're empowered. Um, there's a symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. So it's uh, rumination um, over something, the anxiety. And one of the most common symptoms is that you can be in a situation and all of a sudden you have a flashback or a um, vision of something that other people are not really experiencing, but it's in your head and you have an extreme reaction where you either have to get out of that situation or you're having shortness of breath and you just can't be around it. One of my patients today described that um, she saw a motor vehicle accident and even though her partner had been gone for three years, which is no time at all, she went down to help these people and she said, I, I realized that I have trauma. I have post-traumatic stress disorder. So that's a really good way of describing it is just that you are exposed to something and you find yourself wanting to move away from it or you just shut down and then you're left with pure anxiety and fear and just immobilized. And it is treatable, so let us help you. So, so many questions tonight. Thank you. This is a large question and can be skipped. My mom, a breast cancer survivor, said I need to close the door and walk away from this and act like it never happened. She didn't visit me during any of the treatments, but we talked about sometimes on the phone. She's eight hours away. How can I continue my relationship with her when she avoids my journey? Oh. Um, so I am guessing that your mom was a breast cancer survivor and that you're going through this now. Yes, she didn't visit me during any of my treatments, but we talk sometimes on the phone. She is old school, meaning she doesn't like to talk about things that cause her emotions. So she's one of these gals that says, um, pull up your bootstraps and just walk on. She's not right. I'll tell you that. It doesn't really help. Um, your mom, she closes the door and walks away and you know that for sure. She acts like it never happened, so you know that for sure. It's painful. It must be very painful that she didn't visit you during any of your treatments. What I would say, and I don't know if this is what you want, Molly, but I would say, you know, from my professional opinion, is she's never dealt with it and she can't tolerate watching you go through it. I think you can continue a relationship with her. Um, at a different level. I mean, it, you can't not know what you already know. And what you know is that your mom's not supporting you during breast cancer. What are the ways that she can support you or is she just kind of walled off in general? Um, it, there's so many, like I said, there's losses along the way that you would have never anticipated and it's gotta be really hard that it's your mom. Um, how do you continue a relationship with her? I think you figure out what paths are open to talk about and which ones aren't. And I, you know, pushing on the door or trying to break down the window, I don't think it's going to work with her because she's never dealt with her own. Close the door and walk away. It's just like, that's not, that can't, that doesn't work. It doesn't work for any of us. I really mean emotionally tired. What is this one right here? The last key. We have um, a couple more questions before we're going to have to end for the night. And this one is right there. I've always been a strong woman. I'm five years out and I'm okay, but I'm definitely not the same person. I'm tired. I've told my family that I'm really different. Am I really tired? Sometimes I'm just being lazy. Well, I don't know. I mean, emotionally tired. Yes. And I wonder if you've really you know, I'm guessing, I'm not suspecting this, but I'm just wanting to ask you, have you really dealt with what you had to go through? Um, because I think that's the only way through it is to really kind of realize what it is that you experienced and then talking about it and giving it a voice. I think one of the things we learned a long time ago in um, mental health is that when you give something a voice, and you talk about it, you set yourself free from a lot of the entanglement that it can cause. Um, it sounds to me like there's, you know, you, that you could use some help in working through it. And if you're emotionally tired, it's like if 
you know, you may have some depression or some anxiety or just situational related to the fact that there's things that you would really benefit from talking to somebody about. That would be my best um, question. It says type answer here. Is that okay? Okay. I've always been a strong woman. Okay, we talked about that. Yes. Strong women go through this, by the way. They do. That's it. Okay. So we've got five more minutes. Are there any other? Or I can't thank you enough. You're welcome. I don't know if anyone can hear me. We were getting feedback that um, when Sean and I were trying to moderate, um, there was problems too. So I hope you guys can hear. But um, you've made such a difference in our community, both outside of things and uh, obviously tonight. And we appreciate your guidance and expertise in such a hard um, topic. It's, it's, as you said, it's um, survivorship is not easy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not over when treatment is over. Right. And um, learning to get tools um, to help with some of the things that we deal with um, always helps our lives better, right? And it does. And increase our quality of life. So let's see. I've had people say that they went to a therapist before, but they didn't help them. And I think that that has a lot to do with they haven't they haven't seen oncology patients enough to realize what the journey is like. I have a question before sure. we end. I just thought of this when you brought that up. Um, how do you, when someone thinks, um, and, and they might need to seek out therapists, and I know you've got a long waiting list, but obviously you're at the top of our list. We've been working with you now for, I think, since the beginning of Project Team for right. Patients. Um, because of your specialty, because I think it's so awesome that there is a specialty that deals um, with cancer. And um, but how do you know you have the right therapist? Are there things that we should be looking for when we're mm -hmm. looking for that therapist? Um, because it's, I think that's hard. And I mean, if mm -hmm. you've never been in that world before, how do I go about choosing one? Well, first of all, don't give them too much. Um, don't put them on a pedestal and feel like there's something wrong with you if you don't connect. If you don't connect, you don't connect. You know, it's their people. And if you leave there and you feel a little bit better, if you leave there and you feel a little bit worse, come back and check it out. I have patients say to me, I didn't feel like you were connecting with me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, let's, you know, give me an, you know, let's try this. Um, and then sometimes, you know, it's like friendships. It's like you try to, you know, forge a new friendship and you find out that your world's apart or like a marriage or a relationship. It's like, it's not always a good fit. So for sure, give yourself permission to explore it a little bit, but if you're not getting your needs met, then it's okay to find, there's a lot of therapists in this city. There aren't a lot of oncology providers, mm -hmm. um, psycho-oncology providers, but sometimes you need to go and talk to therapy. Sometimes people need to talk to therapy about things that are going on in their life in addition to what's going on with the cancer. So finding the right therapist has to do with finding the right relationship, the right fit for you. That's a great point mm -hmm. because it is hard. It's like it is. You, you will connect with some and others you want, won't. And, it, and sometimes it's not just about the cancer, like you said. Right. So, and I think, yeah, excuse me. I, I think that, um, like I said, give yourself permission to say this isn't feeling right because you're probably right. It probably isn't a good fit. And um, you can sometimes talk to the therapist and say, this is what I need. This isn't what I need. And um, so Perfect. trust yourself. Okay. That's great. I just, it just popped into my head. Uh -huh. like, How do you go about doing that? And it's like yellow pages. <laughs> and I think just for those of you that feel like you're less than, or there's not as much of you, or that there's been a lot of losses along the way, and you're trying to recover from that and it takes years to recover sometimes i just want to reinforce with you that you're so much more because of it i really do i have so much respect for you thank you thank you very much thank you thank you for your time and i'm sure this will not be the last time that we're together okay Thanks so much so much Barb, and thank you guys for joining us and we'll see you in the new year